Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Today we're going to check out one of the new Jerry Cantrell models. No, not the Gibson version, his new Epiphones. So in case you missed that last episode, Jerry Cantrell, the guy that plays in Alice in Chains, did a lot of songwriting, also does some singing within the band, he got two new Epiphone signatures. The first one, I mean, it looks kind of similar to the Gibson version. It's a wino within the Epiphone range. They're $849 and they look pretty good. I haven't quite had enough time to dig through all the specs on that. However, it seems they ditched the piezo system to save some money. But I wanted to review this other one because it's a completely new thing. And this review was able to happen through my new Guitar Day program, so it's thanks to Dave's purchase that this episode could happen. If you want to learn more about my new Guitar Day program, you can check it out on my website. Essentially, you send me the money, I buy the guitar, I review it, then I send it to you. <laughs> it's nothing too crazy, but let's take a look at this thing. Oh wow! When they called this finish bone white, that is very striking. Like, it's so white, it makes the case look green. So, this is his new Epiphone Prophecy. I've seen a lot of hate online about this one, saying it doesn't look like something Mr. Cantrell would play. Well, he's the one that designed it, so I would hope he would play it, but man... First impressions, I'm actually really impressed with this. It's a very stark white gloss finish. However, the binding has like a green tinge to it, so it almost looks like it would glow in the dark. I'll have to see if that fluoresces under blacklight or anything. Now, that could just be the whole off-white creamy binding that we normally see, but it kind of has an interesting vibe when everything else is bone white. So, I'm not gonna lie to you, these things are expensive. How expensive is expensive? $1,149 for an Epiphone. But you gotta remember, this is part of Epiphone's highest end series at this point in time, the Prophecy lineup. So if you haven't seen these things, here's the Les Paul version right here on the screen. They're essentially Epiphone moderns, but on steroids. They've got premium Fishman electronics, they've got the comfort cuts and the modern heels, and they've got some pretty exotic finishes, right? They're $899. So what makes this $249 more expensive is probably what a lot of people are wondering. Is it all in the artist signature name? No, because you, you gotta remember guys, you gotta step back and actually look at everything that they changed here. First off, this is a custom. So you get the awesome custom emblem on the headstock and that just makes it a little bit more expensive. You also have fancy inlays. Now, the other ones are pretty fancy too, so you can't really say here or there whether that's better or worse, it just kind of depends on you. You've still got the Fishman Electronics, so that's not necessarily a premium. But the biggest thing with this being a custom is the fact that the back is bound as well. However, in the process of binding that, you actually lost all your comfort cuts back here and there's no heel swoop. I could see a lot of people being a little bit upset about that. However, if you didn't really care about that, you now have a full-on fancy looking custom thing. And sure, you have the Jerry Cantrell name on this one, truss rod cover, and his double J's on the back. However, the biggest thing for me is it actually comes in a hard shell case. The other Epiphone prophecies do not from the factory. And we've got Jerry Cantrell's name on the case itself. So is this case worth the full $250? No, but it's probably like, what, $150, $200 value? So add in the whole custom elements, a little bit of a premium for the artist. It's actually pretty fairly priced in comparison to the other offerings within the Epiphone lineup. That's my thoughts anyways. But besides our case here, what kind of candy do we get? Well, it looks like we get a case key and a switch tip. The lifetime guarantee of our locking Grovers on this model. That's a nice feature. We've got a cactus Epiphone sticker. I don't think Dave would mind if I just uh, put it right here on the guitar. <laughs> General Epiphone candy, other stickers. I honestly kind of like all these stickers everywhere. You can hang them up on your wall or something. It looks like uh, advertisement for the Gibson app. It seems kind of cheesy, but I wish Gibson would do like stickers and stuff. I could see people posting those everywhere. So cosmetics and price point aside, I'm really happy with this. So far, just first impressions, feeling this thing right out of the case. It's got a slightly chunkier neck, like it's not big and rounded. It still kind of has that slimmer C carve to it, but it's chunky, so it feels good. We've also got our jumbo frets, and obviously if you didn't notice, there's something weird with our pickup spacing. It's because we've got an ultra-modern 24 fret Les Paul on this thing. Stop bar, two pneumatic, all that good stuff. So to learn more about this one, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs. Inside this bone white Les Paul, let's take a look at its specs. So first off, Fishman Fluence pickups. They're quite fascinating looking under here. 
there's some sort of a printed circuit board, and then they have leads soldered to the board right here. And you're going to notice you actually have five wires on each. And why you need that many is telling you right here, single coil voice two. So this whole system is actually really fancy. You have push pull pots on every single one. So these control your voicings. There's voice one and voice two. I'll be honest, at this time, I don't know what that means. I've never had these pickups. So apparently you have two different sounds and then you have coil splitting abilities. So humbucker mode versus single coil-esque sounds. And then I guess you can probably even blend those. So as far as a versatile guitar goes, this should be very good. We have our typical QR code, as well as the serial number of the guitar right here. And you see this all the time on Epiphones, the way they join the neck to the body. A lot of times you'll see this kind of shoddy looking area, but despite the route here, it's kind of like more of a transitional neck tenon than a long neck tenon. Now our bridge pickup cavity, you can see the mahogany body. And then up here, we actually do still have the maple top, which thankfully is a little bit more exposed right here so you can see it. And you can see whatever that marking was for. But the mahogany body on this example is actually weight relieved. Now, as far as I could see on the spec sheet, they didn't say what kind of weight relieving, but normally if they just say that, it means the nine hole Swiss cheese style. But until I get an x-ray, I won't be able to tell you guys for sure. But now we move on to our hardware. It's actually locking hardware, eh, kind of. It's the Epiphone Locktone series. So what that means is they lock to the post using these little barbs inside here. So once you have it in place and you're just like changing the strings, you don't have to worry about it accidentally falling off. You have to intentionally try to take these things off. Some of them are harder to remove than others. Same thing is true on the tailpiece of these. You can see those barbs a little bit better. However, I will say this is probably the loosest locking one that I've seen as far as the tailpiece goes, but sometimes these can be like impossible to get off. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I really love this brushed nickel vibe on these things. It's not ultra shiny chrome. It has a little bit of a tinge to it is the best way to put it. And that's the same thing they did for our pickups here, as well as our metal knurled knobs. Now, being such a fancy pickup system with all that, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that we're not getting much of a reading here. And the readings we do get don't make much sense traditionally because you're in the 200k ohm setting. That's 20 in the bridge, about the same in the neck, middle position, about half that. Then, of course, you can split in all the other voicing stuff. We'll just have to listen to that. But here's a really good lighting angle to show you kind of that almost slightly greenish tint that the binding has. It's an interesting effect. But I want to talk a little bit more about the finish, too. A lot of Gibsons, they're known. When they start white, they kind of start to turn yellow just because of the clear coat aging on it. This guitar will not do that because it has a poly finish. Well, it won't do it as extreme. So if you've always been eyeing a pure white guitar, like this is closest to Gibson's Arctic white finish, Finish, that would be a reason to pick one of these things up. Now, as far as some other nitpicky attributes, you can see the finish of the body kind of encroaches a bit too much on the binding in this area. I first noticed it right here where it kind of goes out of line. But besides a few issues like that, it actually holds up pretty well. And we do have a little bit of a carved top here. Maybe not as extreme as it could be, but a carved top is a carved top. So moving on from that mahogany body and maple top, we have a mahogany neck with an ebony fretboard. And of course, what makes this thing interesting, as I was telling you earlier, are the 24 jumbo frets. You heard me right. These are true jumbo frets, not the medium jumbos that you normally see on Epiphones and Gibsons. But I really want to take a second to look at the inlays on the fretboard. So essentially, it's a square turned on its side, done up in mother of pearl. But do you see this? That's the wood grain going this direction, whereas most of the time the fretboard grain runs straight. So that tells me these inlays are actually pre-done with a different piece of ebony, and then they just inlay them in the guitar. So all they do is route the neck out for a square channel, and then they plug these things in it. Because the wood grain just runs a different direction on all of them. Now you could say, ah oh, man, that's terrible attention to detail. Or you could go, hey, that kind of makes these things unique because it makes them stand out a little bit more. I'll leave that up to you to decide. The only thing I'm seeing QC wise so far is, uh oh, they got a little bit of white paint on the fretboard. Now is it ultra noticeable? No, but probably should have been cleaned up. Despite having more frets, it's your regular 24 3 quarter inch scale length. I was kind of surprised to see that they only do a 12 inch radius on these guys instead of like a compound 10 to 16 or something like that. That would have been nice. But they generally don't do that on Epiphone models. Now, had this been a Gibson version, probably. <laughs> Let's grab these juicy neck specs 1.7 inches at the nut. And that increases to 2.09 by the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.83, and then chunks up to 0.94. Here's a look at the neck on the first fret and the 12th fret, just a nice rounded C shape. I know I said earlier it's kind of got like a 60s feel as far as the carve of the neck, but it definitely has a pretty decent chunk to it without being crazily thick. But if you don't like big necks, you might want to try one in a store first. 
But now let's get to the headstock. Let's address the elephant in the room. The reason this guitar looks so good is because this headstock diamond is larger than normal Epiphones get. Normally, they look like this. You see how small they are? That's the reason why Chibson Les Paul Customs look so weird. Because you've got the Gibson logo, but they do the tiny Epiphone style Gibson Custom logo. Whereas this guy gets the full on Gibson size. And I love that. I love the fact that Jerry was probably like, hey, I'm, I'm more than willing to do Epiphones, but we gotta make sure that they look good. Because this thing is just so unique all in and of itself. And it's not like trying to be a cheaper version of anything else. That's why I'm so excited to review this particular one. And the other thing is I'm pretty darn sure that's a real mother of pearl, which you don't normally see on Epiphone Customs. I mean, if not, that is some very choice pearloid materials because I mean, that changes all kinds of colors in the lighting. The Epiphone logo has some of that as well, but not quite as extreme. Maybe I just happened to get a particularly nice example. But your truss rod is in there if you need to use it. Kind of hard to see but it's a three screw truss rod cover that has Jerry's name in a very small cursive font, which I think looks pretty nice. That's the other thing I like about this thing. A lot of times black nuts look strange on guitars, but this one, it works because it's like offsetting the white going on everywhere and complementing other things, similar to what our pickup rings are doing. And of course we get the brushed nickel locking Grover tuners. Moving on to the back side, we've got a whole bunch of stuff to look at in here. It's just a whole mess of wires, but when you have five wires coming from each pickup and then whatever wires from your toggle switch over here, of course it's going to look like a rat's nest in here. But we can see our push-pull pots here. You've got your capacitors. It appears to be on some sort of like a hybrid quick connect to solder joint system. But you can see they didn't completely clean up the routes. It seems like a, a relatively rushed job as far as that goes. But it is important to note that the Prophecy series utilizes a battery for these Fishman Fluence pickups. Now it's nice the way that they've done it because you don't actually have to unscrew anything to get to your battery. If it's dead, you need to charge it or whatnot. This is the easy kind of open. You just lightly pull it and then it pops up. You even have this little blue ribbon right here to help you take it out. And wow, impressive, they're using Rayovac. Stock from the factory, sometimes you get kind of weird looking ones. <laughs> and then the back plate here does have some shielding. But there's not too much else to look at back here. It's just your regular Les Paul custom style here with the double bound body. Makes it look fancy, but maybe you would prefer the version that has the comfort cuts. I'm kind of glad this is something completely different from everything else though, but regular strap button locations. Running up the back side of our neck here, also nice and gloss in a stark white color, and you get your Double J logo, handcrafted in China sticker, and inspection sticker. Now, these will come off. That's under the finish. You could probably also take that off if you really wanted to. But here's our serial number, which dates this one to 2021. And we can take a look at our Grover tuners. Just in case you've never had locking tuners before, you turn this left or right to lock or unlock it, and then you pull the string taut through it. Then once you've done that, you lock it in place. The reason why locking tuners are superior is the fact that you don't actually have any windings around your post, so you have less stretching issues, which in theory should make the tuning stability better. However, if you know how to properly wrap a tuning post, it's all just about speed. Now I noticed this one straight from the factory wasn't actually strung properly. They had a bunch of winds on it. I think they do that at the factory so less strings break because sometimes when you're stretching strings in and you've locked it in, if you don't have it completely tightened down, they'll slip out and then you can't use it anymore. But all said and done, not a bad weight, 7 pounds, 12.3 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and try to get some tone samples out of this thing. There's a lot to demo. It's probably going to be a little bit intimidating to do. I'll try to keep it simple so you can hear all the different tonalities. All right, let's go ahead and run through these tones. We'll start with our neck pickup and run through all of our options. extremely versatile. I noticed these have kind of like an EMG punch to them. So if you have it all the way on 10, you got to worry about that. But if you just slightly back it off to like eight or nine, it kind of sounds more like normal humbuckers again. You lose 
just a little bit of volume when you do that coil split, but I really like the tones of this. Bright and punchy. Yeah, when you switch between them, you really notice that volume difference. But now between voice one and two, it's almost like a coil tap. You know, you've got the split on this one, then almost like a tap-esque sound. It just gives you an interesting different tone. Let's see if we can demonstrate that a little bit more. That's just the neck pickup. Let's try all that again with our bridge. similar to the neck pickup. Incredibly clear. That's what I'm noticing about the tones, just straight on as they're intended. Then you activate that coil split again. It kind of sounds like a really good Telecaster. You know they have that nice low end choke, 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 choke sound? That's what I'm talking about. And now compare the voicings. Sounds so similar to that split. Just a little bit less congested, I guess you could say. difference is very big between regular and non on this. And oh boy, the middle position, you, you can get crazy. You can split the neck, have voice two on the bridge, voice one here. <laughs> it's too complicated to demo everything. I'm, I'm gonna try my best here with just some simple stuff. <laughs> Personally, prefer that coil split tone just about on all of these. It kind of makes it sound not like a normal Les Paul, and I like that. But let's go ahead and try some distorted tones on this as well. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now that we know all about the new Jerry Cantrell signature prophecy Epiphone, where are my final thoughts? Dave, thank you so much for doing the new Guitar Day purchase on this. I had a blast. This is one of the best Epiphones I think I've demoed in a long time. Now, I'm a big fan of the Epiphone Les Paul Modern because you get all those modern specs for a relatively affordable price point. Now, this one's almost twice as expensive, but I really just thought this was kind of going to be a gimmick, but... I love the way this thing looks. It's got its own thing going on that's not necessarily just Jerry Cantrell. I like Alice in Chains, right? There's some really good songs within their discography, but I'm not gonna lie to you and say I'm the biggest fan of their work in the world. So this is one of those signature guitars that transcends the artist. Like sure, it has his name right here on the truss rod cover and you got the JJ on the back, but I mean, that's not super branded or anything. Anybody can pick this thing up and love it. So if you always wanted one from the Prophecy series, you can guess that they're going to sound very similar to this one. So you could save a little bit money if you don't care about the hard case or the artist signature. But if you've always wanted like a really highly specced out Epiphone that is a true custom, it's got the beautiful headstock and all that, I think you would really enjoy this. I was a bit skeptical before I'd had it in my hands because almost 1200 bucks is a lot to pay for an Epiphone, but man, this packs a punch. I'm happy with it. I think you should try one out at a store. As far as negative attributes, I did have to do a little bit of a setup from the factory. The neck is actually too straight. I need to put just a little bit of relief in it for my own personal playing preferences. And I noticed the metal is a little bit weak right here. I had to do some adjustment and you can see it kind of marred it just a little bit. So definitely be careful when you're doing that. And even if you're not normally a fan of active pickups, again, just turn the volume down a little bit and you'll be good to go. It, this is a extremely versatile guitar. I didn't realize it did all the other voicings when I first got this thing. So, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed checking out the new Jerry Cantrell Prophecy Series guitar with me. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.